banking for some businesses in Guernsey has been described as a crisis, which is getting worse. Small and non-finance firms are reporting more issues by the week, including sudden account withdrawal, lengthy delays for necessary procedures, and a sense of dread over the continuation of operations. Others are said to have been put off the island as a business place entirely because of the issues. This led to Diane Degare, President of Guernsey's Chamber of Commerce, and Tim Charlestone, a director of local bookkeeping firm TCS, to pen letters highlighting the crisis and calling for action from all sides. Express sat down with the pair to probe deeper into these problems. If I was a business owner right now in Guernsey, either living in the island or thinking of moving to the island, what are the sort of challenges, what are the considerations I have to sort of take into account when I want to set up a business, get a bank, a business banking account? You need to allow a lot of time. And if you've been running a business elsewhere, I think it will surprise you how much harder it is to run a business from Guernsey. There's just... Um, delays and barriers every which way we turn from from choice of banks we can open accounts there's far fewer regulated and operating and accepting Guernsey companies um, to the, the, the very manual processes that the banks operate so if you're in the UK you probably could you know pop into a branch do everything online um, and you'd have an account open within a day probably week max here the banks are advising it's an average of 16 weeks wait. And then even after the 16 weeks, that 16 weeks isn't necessarily to open the account because if they decide to decline your application, that takes 16 weeks as well. And as an example of the how complex the process can be, one of the four banks that exist here, their process to open a standard business trading account is first fill in an inquiry form on their website, then wait for a phone call from them, then receive a questionnaire to fill in, which is an Excel sheet, return that questionnaire, and then only then, if they're satisfied, then you get an application form. Then you fill in the application form, you return that with all of your documents, assuming everything's done, then it's 16 weeks. At that point, they also advise you not to apply with any other banks while you're waiting to hear from them. They can do it quicker. Like, I know they can. and But there is manual processes behind it, which slows them up. But we, you know... We, we lack the tech that is available in the UK for these banks and the automation, the way that you can just, you know, do an awful lot of the due diligence online through Companies House, everything. I, though, managed to open an HSBC business account within a week. Like, so it can be done. And I know they always say, make sure all the forms are right. There should be no reason to decline you. And they won't be able to tell you a reason they've declined you if there are any you know, particular concerns. Um, so it, it can be done, but it isn't being done as a rule. And what sort of time frame could you expect, say, in the UK um, for the exact same process that we, you've just talked about? Days. Sometimes yeah. it's instant. You can open a business account through an app. You know, all the challenger banks that have all the functionality we would want, like all the open banking, the bank feeds into your accounting systems, everything, like, they're, they're almost instant. You know, you go through an online process, it looks you up on company's house, you do your due diligence of a video with your passport and CDD, etc., and your, your account can be open in, in hours, minutes. And even after they've opened the account, sometimes they then ask for more information, but your account is open and active while you're providing that information. It's on the understanding that if you ignore their requests and don't provide it, maybe they'll restrict your account. But generally, most people don't do that. Most people do provide the information that the bank asks for. Last time I personally opened a business bank account in the UK was about 10 years ago. It took, and it was with one of the high street banks, it took 12 days and I got an apology that it had taken 12 days in writing um, because they considered that too long. Their target was six days, six working days. Um, and finally, there are banks like, they their process has been slowed down a bit since COVID, which is everyone's excuse um, but Metro Bank prior to 2020 as a great example you could walk in and assuming you had your proof of ID and everything with you then they can do like Diane says all of the all of the company's house look 
look ups everything all automated they could not only open your account there and then but you would walk out of the branch an hour later with a debit card a checkbook a paying in book and your account is ready to go mm. and you, you received an apology you said some years ago what's the sort yeah. of reaction or response that's given to local business holders who encounter these delays or or other problems none really there's no the, the, the attitude of the banks is very much that's how long it takes um, and they all have a different reason. One bank will tell you, oh, it's because we, we don't have access to, to um, beneficial ownership information. Another bank will tell you, oh, it's all our account openings done in the Isle of Man and they're very busy. Another one will say, yeah, our account opening is done locally, but we're, you know, we're really, really short staffed and don't have time. Um, it's always a different excuse. There's also, like Diane mentioned earlier, if they do decline your application, they're not going to tell you why. So you don't then know whether you should take your exact same application to another bank or whether there's something you need to resolve first. Yeah, but often they can't. Due to no, of course they can't. Rates. No, exactly, exactly. But they're, um, they're not, for example, they're, I'm aware that one of the banks has a rule that they can't on, they, their pool of accounts can't contain more than X percentage of any industry. But they won't tell you, oh, I'm really sorry, you know, you're opening a pub and we just can't open any accounts for pubs right now. Obviously, yeah, for AML reasons, they can't always tell you why. But sometimes there is a really simple reason. Even, oh, did you know your your name is spelled wrong on Guernsey Registry compared to your passport and therefore you need to get that resolved? They can't tell you any of that. Well, most of the time they can't. Some of the time they can and they won't. Okay. And of course, um, these kind of issues came to wider attention about a week and a half ago after Chamber of Commerce published uh, a letter uh, in which it uh, basically just called out, not called out, but raised awareness of the issue and had some case studies in there. Uh, and one of those case studies was a business uh, that reported, um, like you say, taking 16 weeks to open an account. And um, one of them received a letter notifying that the closure of their business accounts was imminent, um, despite operating without issues for the past 15 years and is creating challenges for their day-to-day -day operations. So that's one case study, but there, there are more out there right now, aren't there? So we at Chamber um, we have been planning to do a survey on banking this year. Like, I'd say the reasons I stood for Chamber President um, and I took the role is because I work with an awful lot of small businesses in my day job, small and medium local trading businesses. And I think... Um, it is really hard to run a, a non-finance business from Guernsey. There's so many barriers and there's some specific like banking and payment platforms and that, that I'm trying to improve that situation. So we wanted to do a banking survey to gather new data, to meet with um, the Committee for Economic Development, to talk to the regulators and say, these are the issues and see if we can improve any and remove the barriers. As we were like getting our... Um, banking survey together we had a number of businesses over the last few weeks contact us that they've been yeah I mean and we're talking in in the main we're talking um estate agents payroll businesses and other and something like that where they have pulled money accounts NatWest RBSI have given them 90 days notice that they're closing all of their accounts including pulled money and they're citing that it's a commercial decision based on regulation and their lead regulator is Jersey and they're saying that uh, hopefully they'll get another bank in Guernsey that doesn't have a Jersey regulator because that has driven the issue. They've been given 90 days you can't open a new account in 90 no. days um, let alone if you know there is perhaps a you know, a different type of bank account, more complex, the pooled money, client money's accounts. But these are, estate agents are regulated, prescribed businesses. You know, they have to do all the AML on their clients and everything. They're regulated by the GFSC, yet their account is being closed due to regulation elsewhere. So we've got banks headquartered elsewhere making decisions that make the situation in Guernsey even worse. And if you look at um, this potentially slightly anecdotal because it's from a client who has businesses in both jurisdictions. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you look at the difference between, um, so he has a business both here and in Gibraltar. And in Gibraltar, they have a locally headquartered bank, Gibraltar National Bank or whatever it's called. And the difference between using NatWest Gibraltar and using Gibraltar National Bank is like night and day. Um, because they only operate in Gibraltar, they're only regulated and headquartered in Gibraltar. 
So they have an advantage there because they're able to have exactly like Diane says, like then they've not got this off island influence that they're being driven by. Mm. And, and like lots of people always say, oh, we need a local solution in that. And I actually on, on banks, yes, it, it absolutely can work. Um, I have a different issue on payment platforms, but I just mm. want us to have the same service that we would get if we banked with the high street banks in the UK. And I don't really think that's too much to ask. And yeah. also with RBSI closing these accounts, they've, they've given notice on the whole relationship, which I think was a mistake on their part. They in a call that we had with the head of um, RBSI, he said they only were supposed to give notice on the actual pooled money account. But that's just pulling the rug from underneath the business. Mm. Like they either need to quickly open another account and probably the bank stepping up to do this, you know, I know who they are. There's only one that is like in the running. Other, than, You know, three are already saying no. And I know that they don't offer open banking. So it's a real step back for businesses to have gone from having bank feeds and better admin and functionality to going, right, we're just grateful you say yes, but we'll have to take a step back in service. It's incredibly expensive as well because they're talking about 750 quid application fee, even if they then decline the account. Oh, who is? Uh, Lloyd's. Really? Yeah. Mm. And is this um, what we've just discussed now? Is that a more recent phenomena on top of sort of the historical issues with uh, delays in account opening? What, the charging? Charging and the um, threat of withdrawal. It's so, not threat, threat, it is withdrawal. Yeah, and it's, so that it's is unilateral. specific. They have, um, they've reviewed their, uh, their client accounts and they've decided that there is a type of account they won't support in all of the Crown dependencies. Um, Gibraltar, Isle of Man, Guernsey and Jersey. Um, so they're withdrawing that offering Um Although JSE Chamber of Commerce have said no one's raised that there, so I don't know if if a state agent is regulated in Jersey, if they can still bank there, because potentially then there wouldn't be the same commercial decision based on regulation. Um, But that is is the new big issue that's come up and impacting. Well, there's at least uh, half a dozen businesses that are established, long trading, local, big names that have contacted us. To, um, to raise their concerns about this in the last few weeks. Mm. And Tim, you also published a letter. Um, in your letter, you raise that we've just spoken about existing businesses, long-standing businesses, yeah. but there's also an issue of people who are thinking of setting up in Guernsey who have been put off by this situation. Yeah, I mean, I've got two great examples, one of which is actually running a business here, but it's very frustrating, and one of which now isn't. Um, we had a client referred to us by somebody else um, who was, it's an online retailer, basically, very, very successful, very high turnover. He was looking to relocate his operations here um, from where he was previously based in Cambridgeshire. Um, and he was estimating that over the course of two years, he'd probably employ around 20 staff. Okay, He'd be renting premises, he'd be employing staff who would be paying you know, income tax and social security and spending money in the economy. And obviously he'd be spending a lot of money with Guernsey Post on on distribution and all the other things that you spend money on when you run a business in Guernsey. Um, Because of the issues he had with opening bank accounts, including one of the high street banks opened him an account, it took 14 weeks, opened his account and then a week later wrote to him saying, I'm sorry, we shouldn't have opened this account for you and closed it. and it wasn't a it wasn't a high risk product or anything he was selling. It was just that he was a purely online retailer. Because of that, over the course of six months, he got so incredibly frustrated. He then spoke to a family member in Spain who said, "Oh, well, why don't we look at doing it in Spain?" Just did it in Spain instead. So he offshored. And now, last time I spoke to him, he actually employs forty one staff now. So that's forty one staff that could have been employed in Guernsey. But because he was unable to open a bank account, and he applied with every bank. And this is a high net worth individual as well, who normally every institution in Guernsey bends over backwards to help, not interested. Um, so that's, you know, if, if, that's, if that's a one-off, then it's sad, but I doubt it's a one-off. There must be other examples of that out there. Um, another thing that's happening more commonly, and I'll use one specific example, this, this is something I've seen time and time again. You've got someone running a local business, a trading business in town, and they have been trading now for one year 
they are still unable to open a business bank account. The reason they're unable to open a business bank account is that they, the individuals that own this company, have been on Ireland for seven years. They are from Portugal originally. They've always used Revolut as their personal account, which everyone has always said, yeah, that's fine, that's fine, that's absolutely fine. Because of that, all of the banks are saying, well, you haven't actually had a bank account for the last seven years because Revolut isn't really a bank, so we're not even taking an application from you. So their business now, that means that they're forced to use sum up instead of a sort of in inverted commas proper credit card provider, which is more expensive. Um, they're using a sum up business account to run their day to day um, banking, which has the risk of being withdrawn at any time. And they are unable to bank cash. And you can't even really recycle that cash to pay suppliers anymore because nobody really takes cash. So they're, they're trying their best to run a business. They're being hampered at every turn by the inability to access banking. Mm. And they don't want anything complex. They don't need a loan. They don't need an overdraft. They don't need a credit card. They don't need a mortgage. They don't need any of that. They just need a bank account where money can go in and out. Yeah. So that's uh, obviously serious. And there are obviously people who are not able to even use services like SumUp. Yeah. And we'll come on to Guernsey Community Savings. Diane, you spoke publicly about you know, sort of the role that they're having to play for some businesses locally um, and the, the kind of the fact that it's unfortunate that such a service needs to exist uh, at all. Could you, could you expand on that? Yes, yeah, so I, I don't know an awful lot about it, but I, um, I was at a charity event recently where they presented and it was brilliant and I was really surprised and I spoke to them after. I said, I honestly didn't know that there was such an issue on the personal banking front. I said, I knew, like, you know well-documented issues about business banking and, you know, people being debanked and not being able to open accounts and just poor service and delays. But I didn't know that, you know, on a personal level, there were people in Guernsey who literally have been refused a bank account. And, you know, you can't, you, you can't get a job if you don't have a bank account. You can't buy your kids' presents online. You, you, all you have is cash you can't save. You know, imagine imagine living without a bank account, without a credit card, without a debit card. It, it, I just, I just could not even can't even get the bus. Yeah, I yeah, couldn't please. understand that scenario. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, it it's so prohibitive in life. And I spoke to them about it. Um, and I said I didn't realise this, this was such an issue. And they said, well, no, in the UK, um, you're it's it's. There's regulation against financial exclusion, so this doesn't happen. So they said one of the key aims of our charity is to make this issue known enough to do ourselves out of a need for this charity. But in the meantime, they set up banks for people who can't get a bank account in the normal process um, to help them so that they have a basic bank account. They can't go overdrawn, but they can save, they can have a debit card, and, you know, they can rejoin normal life and there's lots of reasons that people might be refused but they wouldn't be elsewhere like you know they might have had a record but people mm. people you know have served their time and they need yeah. to come out and be able to rejoin society and you know it's just the the, the the law around that that was passed in the UK many years ago was that all the banks must provide a, it's called a basic bank account. Now, every bank interprets that differently and some offer more facilities than others. But the very basic idea is you have a bank account in your name. You can pay money into it. You can withdraw money from it. You get a debit card. Now, for some of them, they are restricted further depending on why you are unable to open a full bank account. So, for example, if you had a history of minor financial fraud, like by which I mean people um, claiming chargebacks on their debit card for, for um, incorrect reasons, that kind of thing, they might, for example, say, okay, this person can't have online banking, it'll be reviewed in six months. They must do their business in branch or over the phone. Annoying, but you still have a bank account, right? They might say, this person can't actually set up any direct debits, so you're gonna have to pay all your bills by debit card, okay? Again, annoying, but doesn't actually exclude you from anything. Mm. The basic ability to have a bank account in your name, pay money in, pay money out, because what you're also doing by excluding these people from banking, <coughs> excuse me, you're opening people up to being the victim of financial fraud. Let's say that I've, um, for whatever reason, I can't have a personal bank account, okay? But I'm earning money and I have things that I need to pay. So maybe I'll use a relative's bank account, okay? A friend. What if that person then decides they're just gonna take all my money? I, it would be very difficult for me to have any recourse to them. So you're opening people up to um, financial victimization and co coercion and control as well. Mm -hmm.
Mm. So it's a much wider issue than, oh, isn't it a nuisance I can't have a bank account? Yeah. But that's how a lot of the banks and, and to some extent certain other people that have commented publicly on it in the past seem to be treating it is that, oh yeah, isn't it awful, but never mind, it's not really that bad. It is that bad and it can have really far-reaching serious consequences. Mm -hmm. I would love to see there be a good side of regulation over here. And I'm not saying there isn't a good side of regulation, obviously. Um, but in this, it, like, I would like us to, you know, ensure that there is a certain level of service so that we don't have need for charities like this and businesses also get a fair service that would be available elsewhere. I'd, I'd basically like to see a basic banking law passed that included businesses as well. Mm -hmm like the exact same provision, pay money in, get money out. Everything else is additional. Yeah. So we I want the frills for business. Yeah, I want, the, I want the frills as well. <laughs> I don't want basic, <laughs> I want everything. I want the frills as well, but if we have the basic thing first, then everything else is just something to push for. Like, hey, you've already done this. Why not give us bank feeds? Why not give us this? Why not give us multi-user access? Why not give us multiple debit cards? All that is stuff that can be pushed to be added on. I, but they don't even have the basics at the moment. Mm. On the subject of legislation, we did ask uh, the Committee for Economic Development, which is the responsible State Department in this area, last week, on the back of um, what both of you two had said publicly, um, if they were aware of the issues and what they were planning on doing about them. So they say that they are currently in the process of a general review of the banking sector in collaboration with the other Crown dependencies to try and ease some of the banking issues being felt offshore. That includes... Um, considerations such as an increased number of locally licensed banks uh, to reduce issues with opening bank accounts and improving locals' access to credit cards, which is obviously a sort of slightly separate but uh, also interlinked um, thing. Um, from your perspective and on the back of learning that, do you think that that's, uh, that's adequate, that's encouraged, um, or does government need to do, need to do more? I I mean, for me, it's encouraging, but I, I, I want to see that there is real action being taken and there is momentum. But it's a, you know, it's a promising start, isn't it? Yeah, I'd say, you know, clearly we all need to do more um, because we're a long way off being where we need to be to, you know, have a level playing field with, you know, our close neighbours. Yeah. Are you aware of these issues affecting Jersey businesses as well? Because uh, they, they mentioned that I spoke to some of my colleagues in the Jersey office. Uh, they were they were not aware of quite the same issues that have been raised here. The from again, this might be purely anecdotal, but from people I've spoken to in Jersey, the reason they're not seeing these issues is they have Santander, who seem to be way better than all of our banks at dealing with these issues. Santander, I'm aware, have been looking to open a branch in Guernsey for quite some time, but for whatever reason, they haven't achieved it yet. And I think, you know, that's how we can drive things forward as well. If we have more choice, yeah. you know, in, in the UK as well, with all the challenger banks, that is increasing the choice for the business user, but also upping the service everywhere. Um, so, yeah, it would be great if we have more licensed local banks. I don't think that's an easy thing to action unless no. there's a queue of, uh, you know, good banks requesting local licenses. Um, I know um, I've spoken to Butterfield Bank recently and they're like looking at their journey to local. They've now opened savings accounts for businesses here. Um, they're looking at um, getting a credit card off the line and they've got a number of issues. And they are talking to us about what businesses want and what direction they're trying to go in. And there's a real intent to offer a, a, a proper local service as a local bank. So, you know, there's, there's definitely some hope and it's great that... Um, Ever, like you know, talking that way, and we've met with them many times. And one of the reasons we're doing a new survey is to gather like up to date data so that we can take that to the committee and, and, and talk to them about it. And hopefully, there might be some easy wins. And you know, just yeah. demonstrating, you know, I mean, I'm a firm believer in, in, in data to drive decisions, but you know, we can all talk anecdotally about it different issues we you know here we want to see that this is across the board mm. my accountancy practice has hundreds of local trading clients that you know we see it on an everyday basis from like the the setup phase to the just trying to get a mandate changed yeah. later on in, in the business life you know it's it's just painful and that's a point actually that like a, and a mandate change is a very specific thing that takes a long long time and can actually damage businesses because they can't 
give instruction lawfully and correctly to their bank account. We had a client recently who request, who put through a mandate change about a year ago now, mid-July last year, um, presented all docs, everything fine. The bank said, yeah, this is perfect. It will take 12 weeks. Well, that on its own is ridiculous. Then it was discovered fairly recently that the mandate had not been updated. Um, when the when the client then sort of raised a bit of a fuss with the bank, they said, oh my goodness, we're really, really sorry. This is terrible. This should never have happened. We'll get that resolved for you. The mandate was updated the next day. So they can do it in 24 hours. So why does it take 12 weeks? Mm. Okay. Um, and that's the sort of thing, I think the the approach of... I don't know whether it's economic development or someone else, but if I just say the states in general, whoever, whichever committee or department is responsible, they need to be doing two things, which is number one, they need to be trying to like court and attract other banks to obtain a Guernsey banking license because there isn't a queue of banks, as far as I know, that are like, oh, can we open in Guernsey? They need to convince those banks that they should be saying, right, can we open in Guernsey? Okay. And secondly, is to make sure that the existing banks are giving a decent service. And one of the ways to make sure existing banks are giving a decent service is give them more competition by trying to attract other banks. There are in the UK and in parts of Europe as well, but let's stick to the UK. There are some really excellent business banks and that's both the challenger banks like Starling and Monzo and Tide and about 20 others. And it's also some of the older high street banks. So for example, Santander right or even nationwide as a mutual okay metro bank who are absolutely fantastic there's many 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 licensed retail bankers in the uk that we should be trying to attract mm. uh, i suppose moving forward that's that's what needs to be considered and this survey as well have you had a good uptake to it have there been uh, strong responses or not encouraging responses, but I, I haven't. Responses. I haven't looked at any okay. of the responses yet, but I think you know there's certainly um, a, a lot of people clicking through to it, and so you know I just urge all businesses to please share your feedback. Mm -hmm. It's That's a good it. survey. It doesn't take very long to do. I have filled it in. Yeah, <laughs> I'd just like to end on one point that you raised, Tim, in your letter, um, which was you raised uh, if a solution can be found involving Guernsey Post, such as a gyro bank type solution or for them to partner with another retail bank. Could you just explain what a gyro bank is? I mean, it, it, was, it wasn't necessarily a gyro bank, but I was more giving an example of, if we can't attract more banks here, what can we do locally to achieve banking services, right? And gyro bank was a thing that existed in the UK. It was set up by the GPO, by the post office, to enable small businesses to access banking services, okay? And the reason why the post office generally works quite well with banking services. They already have the ability to handle large volumes of cash. They already have the ability to process transactions. In, and look, I mean, for example, right, the Guernsey Post process all of the transactions for your co-op dividends, right? That is really not that different from just money in and out of a bank account, really. Um, for me, I don't think that's the ideal solution, right? I'm saying that that is kind of something that we should be exploring and looking into and whatever section of the states needs to do that. For if, are we still sitting here in two years time with these same problems or have the problems got any worse? We need to be looking at an alternative, which is, okay, how do we make this happen? If you decide tomorrow to quit your job and go and open a shop, a cafe, uh, uh, become a plumber, anything like that, can you really afford to not have a bank account for 16 weeks? No. So is there a solution where using infrastructure that is already there a, a a service can be provided and that could even be you know business accounts let's not forget are not free you pay money to operate a business account that could even be a revenue stream for Guernsey Post and given all the closing of branches you know yeah. there, there potentially is a way that uh you know the banks could work with the post office yeah. as an additional counter service and and that's not just the high street banks that are already here like Starling Bank, you can open personal accounts and you can open sole trader accounts if you're um, a Guernsey sole trader, but you can't open a, uh, a limited company bank account with Starling. But you can't pay cash in then. In the UK, you'd be able to go to the post office and pay it yeah. into a Starling account. Now, I know that Guernsey Post have said to me that they'd be absolutely willing to work with Starling. But of course, we've just kind of got the barrier of size. We're not the first door that Starling is knocking on to grow their, you know, their client base or their offering.
And we so, so we need government to step in. We need the regulators to be involved in this, all the stakeholders to be part of this, to, to move it forward. It, like you mentioned, does Jersey have all these issues? I think, I think they do, but like you say, you know, the more choice there, potentially it's less of an issue. But Jersey also has a lot more investment in non-finance industries. So the, in, in Guernsey, all of the state's funding goes to, you know, Guernsey Finance and things like that. There is, there is no body, like Jersey has Jersey Business, which has oh, several million pounds per annum mm -hmm. funding to help businesses and support on these type of issues. Whereas, you know, ECDEV do it as part of their remit. Um, Guernsey Chamber, we have like probably with a, biggest business membership organization with a non-financial like group of members you know we have both we're a mix but we really do represent them you know the sort of more local trading firms more than any of the others and you know that's pretty much entirely voluntary we get no states funding at all to help us which is good and bad but you know more needs to be done to fix these issues and i think all the stakeholders really need to be involved because it's getting worse all the time i honestly stood <laughs> to be part of chamber in the hope that this would improve and whilst we have removed some barriers along the way and we've made some small changes there's some big issues that just means it's getting worse and worse Thank you for listening to The Interview, a Bailiwick Express podcast. If you liked what you heard, please like and subscribe. You can find us on all social media channels, and if you'd like to keep up to date on all the work The Express team does, please sign up to our daily email by visiting gsy.bailiwickexpress.com.